Welcome. Welcome to the Anderson Ranch. My name is Alex Sanchez. I am a ranch trustee, as well as the president and CEO of Voces Unidas de las Montañas. We are the first Latina, Latino created, Latina and Latino led nonprofit organization based here in the Roaring Fork, uh, uh, Roaring Fork Valley uh, uh, here. So welcome uh, to the ranch and welcome to this panel. It is a pleasure uh, for me to join extraordinary artists um, and all of you uh, for this discussion. This is the Finding Your Voice, Culture and Community in Latinx Art. Before I introduce our, our panelists, I want to just um, speak a little bit about uh, sort of what, what's happening uh, within, within the state. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that on Monday, I know we have a lot of educators uh, in the room, uh, Monday's a holiday in Colorado. On Monday, we will celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. And so I just want to acknowledge also that we still stand on stolen land um, here in the Roaring Fork Valley that belongs to the Ute uh, people. Um, also want to sort of uh, acknowledge the, all the wonderful supporters who contribute uh, to the Anderson Ranch, specifically to the Ian and Chris Reyes Foundation, for making the Latino, uh, the Latinx education program possible. The Latinx education program is a multifaceted uh, three-year program in support of Latinx arts and education. Just like as a Latino myself, I know it's Hispanic Heritage Month as well, but as a Latino, I celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month every single day, 365 days a year. And so I think, the, I think the Anderson Ranch is also sort of modeling how Latinx programming should be done, not just in September or October, but throughout the year. So the Latinx program is a year-round opportunity for members of the community up and down the valleys to be able to, to participate and have dialogue with uh, extraordinary artists uh, like the panelists uh, this evening. I want to give a shout out to the folks that make this possible. I want to give a shout out to Olivia. Do you want to raise your hand, Olivia? Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Olivia Martinez, along with the rest of the team, obviously, at the Anderson Ranch, um, are making the, these pro, th this program, this panel, in, in the Latinx education uh, in arts and community possible. So I would just want to give her a shout out for making this initiative uh, in her vision. Also want to give a shout out to Peter, the CEO of the Anderson Ranch in the back, as well as the rest of the staff uh, for being supportive, inclusive, and modeling how this programming uh, should be done. <laughs> Let's give him a round of applause as well, please. Thank you. So now I'm going to introduce our extraordinary panelists. They are no strangers to the Anderson Ranch. So many of you actually were part of the workshops earlier today. Raise your hand if you're part of the, and, uh, the workshops earlier today. So many of you got to see, obviously already, and meet Rafael and Ricky uh, and Lillian. Uh, Ricky and Rafael are visiting artists, so they're here at the ranch, and they'll be here for a couple more weeks. Uh, Lillian also has been a guest artist and has done other workshops at the ranch before, so welcome back, uh, Lillian. Rafael Farjado, uh, let me uh, start with him. Uh, he is an artist, designer, researcher, and educator who has been creating boundary blurring video games as an, arts for, as an art form since the early 2000s. Uh, these games have been exhibited in museums and festivals worldwide. Please help me welcome Rafael Farjado. All of these artists have an extraordinary background and journey. We also have those bios in, uh, with, uh, in your seats so you can read more about their extraordinary backgrounds. Um, Lillian Lara, is a mixed media artist specializing in uh, custom design, paper mache installations, and rascuache art. In true rascuachismo fashion, she makes the most of the least, creating a new identity in every work um, as, an, as an act of defiance and innovation. Please help me welcome Lilian Lara. <laughs> and last but not least, Ricky Armendariz was raised in the U.S.-Mexico border, a region that is heavily influenced that has that that, that has heavily influenced his artistic, 
aesthetic and conceptual ideas. He creates images from cultural, biographical, and art historical references that are carved and burned into the surfaces of the large-scale paintings, drawings, and wood blocks. Please help me welcome Ricky. I've had the pleasure, obviously, to join uh, portions of the workshops and see many of you uh, in action and see the beautiful work. I've also had the pleasure uh, to chat offline with these extraordinary uh, artists. Uh, let's start with uh, sort of a general sort of question that helps us understand a little bit about you. So let's start, um, if you could share a little bit about who you are, your work, and what has inspired your journey as an artist. And could we start with you, Ricky? <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Ricky Armendares, and um, I'm, uh, as they said, I'm from El Paso. I uh, came to art a, a little bit late um, in my career. I didn't have very many role models c growing up, and, but I was constantly making art. And I, I feel that um, the kinds of uh, kind of circuitous route that I took to become an artist um, has really informed a lot of the the references that are in my work, um, the things that are most important to me uh, as an educator and as a father, as a, a, a husband, um, and a father of uh, three kids. That's great. And some of his work, as well as the rest of the work, will be on display um, here in our PowerPoint presentation. Uh, thank you, Ricky. Lillian? Yeah, I think... Um, I think for many artists, you have this like urge to create and it just keeps bubbling and bubbling to the surface until you have to get it out. And so for me, that's kind of how it's been for the majority of my life. And so the things that were accessible to me were definitely clothes and fabric and recycled goods. And so that's kind of what I gravitate towards and what kind of influences uh, that kind of passion. Also that like survival aspect of you got to use what you got to make sure that you can express yourself. And so that's kind of where I come from. And um, so, yeah, the, um, I was born in Colombia and raised in San Antonio, Texas. So there's a little bit of a, a through thread that we'll see tonight. Um, my parents were very scared that they, they recognized that I had some artistic tendencies when I was 10 and were scared that I couldn't feed myself. Um, so um, they, they sort of prompted me toward engineering, medicine, or law. I tried engineering and that didn't really work out for me. Um, and so it, it, for me, the making is very existential. I was sharing with someone at lunch that I don't feel good about myself if I spend too long without making something. And so it's become my acknowledgement of self-care and the best self that I can possibly be is making something to share with others and put it into the world. And it happens to be through video games. so how it goes. That's great. You know, obviously the, there's a theme with this panel and this in, in today's activities about sort of Latina, Latino, Latinx, Latine as an identity. And so I'm wondering that I, you know, as a Latino myself, I know that in some spaces that Latinx identity is homogenized. But we know that our identity is vast, it's diverse, and it's ever-changing. It continues to change. So I'm wondering, as, as artists, as people, how does your work and your art as an artist expand either upon what it means to be Latina, Latino, Latinx, or, or maybe resist some of these stereotypes? I think that, you know, we as people, um, especially when we travel, right, um, traveling, I think, is the greatest gift to our process and our understanding of the world. Um, me, personally, you know, growing up in El Paso and living on the border, um, I joke that I had um, Texas-centric blinds on, literally like a horse. And I had a, a bullseye focus on what it meant to be me and who I was, um, but I didn't know the world around me. And as soon as you start traveling, um, going to Berlin, uh, to Portugal, uh, to France, uh, to New York, to LA, um, you start realizing that 
you know, your definition of a Latino is so specific, right, to all the Latinos. And not to mention all the brown people that you meet. You know, people would come up to me and, and speak Farsi, um, you know, speak Italian. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times that, um, you know, that would happen. And you know what? I mean, they, for example, Middle Eastern people, they recreate the way we do. You know, uh, they take over the parks the way we do. You know, they grill all day the way we do. Um, you know, it, and, and, but yet they're from a completely different part of the world. And that was a really big eye-opener to me, to, to see people that looked exactly like me, but shared a, a, a different culture, right, than me, right? But we had so many, you know, th the bottom line is that we, we shared more than we were different, you know, ultimately. So traveling was definitely the thing that kind of opened up my eyes. I've been to Medina and Marrakesh um, in Northern Africa. That's uh, I, I also saw myself um, uh, in, in their culture, in their sort of art and how they celebrate and the Unitine family and some of those evening uh, events that they do every, every, every day in the Medina. How about you, Lillian? I think for me, um, there's, there's a lot of influences in the work that I do, right? I, I draw from traditional motifs and for me, it's, I've always loved clothing. Um, I loved outrageous, my brand is outrageous pageantry, right? Where can I wear, you know, blue hair, ridiculous clothing? Um, and so that's not really where I come from. We're, we're a little bit more conservative. I'm from Houston, Texas, and the little community that I grew up in, you know, you don't really dress that um, intensely. And so I, I felt that need to just kind of make my own clothing and present in this kind of way. And I really, I really appreciated looking at like high fashion and looking at the traditional costumes and how to combine those two to kind of, again, represent that I am Mexican, but I also want all of these things. And it's coming up with events to go to and uh, um, all of these fantastic things. But then you go back and you, you travel and you see this kind of drive and all sorts of different cultures and you were like, oh, we're really, we're really a lot more of the same than we are different. And it's really just kind of those little differences in how we express ourselves, but the, the core of it is still the same. Rafael? I think for me, there's sort of, there are two sort of metaphors that I can use for thinking about the, the both the similarities and the differences. Um, so I was born in Colombia. My parents brought me here when I was three. Uh, I was explaining to Ricky that my mother was not allowed in the kitchen when she was a child. Uh, we come from relative economic privilege. I acknowledge this and understand and accept that this has given me certain other privileges here because my parents knew certain, certain things that not everyone has access to. Um, and so I enjoy certain, probably as my success, some of my successes as a consequence of some of these privileges that my parents and grandparents had. Um, the other thing that I think about in terms of sort of, um, sort of highlighting differences and complexity that helps com make complex our Latino, Latine, Latinx identities, the pluralistic of it, all right? It's like, in Colombia, we don't eat jalapenos. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in San Antonio. I love jalapenos. When my family would come up, they couldn't even eat pepperoni pizza from Domino's because it was too spicy. <laughs> and so it's like, ah, you don't know what you're missing. Right? And so, um, you know, I, I have been enculturated and love this, this culinary heritage that was not mine by birth, but uh, that I understand, appreciate, and love. And, and I also love the culinary heritage from where I was born. And it's, it's different and, and beautiful in its own, own other way, right? So I think that you were, you were hoping to sort of help us express it. We are not monolith, right? We are plural. We are our own sort of diversity. We are complicated and complex. And so this is my offering to that. 
That's beautiful. And as a as a Mexican, you know, water is life, but jalapeño is also life. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> we enjoy a little more on the spicy uh, theme. I want to expand a little more about the concept of advocacy and the arts. And I'm wondering sort of what role does does art have in raising awareness or sharing stories or even advocacy on issues that might be passionate? Is that something that you think about as an artist? You know, as an educator, I, I, I think about it all the time. I, I uh, encounter students that are very passionate to change the world around them. Um, and, and I think that that's in, like an incredible drive, right? Um, me personally in my work, I tend to be a little bit more covert, um, a little bit more sly about giving you and talking about difficult things um, that are, are challenging to talk about. Um, but I, I do think that, um, you know, when I, you know, especially now, having taught for more than 20 years, um, I, I really feel the advocacy that relates to me as a person or as an artist comes from my my teaching, <laughs> okay? Because as as I slowly infect you know students with a sense of responsibility for the things that they make and honesty about the things that they make, um, I'm affecting my ecosystem that affects other ecosystems, mm -hmm. and so yeah, I mean you know in a kind of, circu again, circuitous or indirect way, I have um, affected a lot of people, you know, to, to follow the path that they want to follow. A lot of them tend to follow, uh, especially now. I mean, things are so um, tumultuous, right, in the world. Um, and to be able to have that voice as an artist is their duty, right? It's in them, and it's got to get out. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that teaching for me, is uh, the thing that has the most effect, you know, in the world. I used to, I mean, a long time ago, I, you know, I had aspirations for my work to, to really kind of shake the, you know, shake the ground, you know, and, but, but I, but I'm realistic, you know, in what my work can do in the, in this moment. Lillian? I think for me, visuals always have this transformative effect, right? You can communicate without language, without um, interpretation, without words. So you can come across these things that might be a little difficult to uh, put in language because either you minimize things um, out, of, out of kind of a knee-jerk reaction. And so with art, you have this beautiful, capability to just connect with someone, whether you know it is in the current moment or way after you've passed away. And so there's this beautiful conversation that you're having with the person who's interacting or viewing your art. And I think that in and of itself, especially, you know, growing up saying parents, you know, like, how are you gonna feed yourself? You're a I don't want you to be a starving artist. We're not economically well off enough to afford you to be an artist. Please find other work. And then now when they see what I can do, you know, it's a little bit of like hindsight 2020. It's like, oh, why didn't you do this? And it's like, well, we had this conversation. <laughs> um, and so I think to have young people especially to see that and be like, you're doing it. I was like, I am, I really am. Um, you can do it too, you know, I'm not different from you. Uh, I, I just decided to go full in on it. And not to say that I'm leaving my job, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think the, the courage it takes to pursue something that creative, right? When your family is telling you like, how's that gonna work? Um, are you gonna be okay? And I think just to have other people look at it and and see it on that level, I think is, is really, really powerful. Thank you. Rafael? I think about advocacy on uh, a number of different levels. So in, in my creative work, in my creative practice, and I, I'll use the plural because I, I work in collaboration. In our creative practice, um, we came to the realization that in the design and creation of video games, we're 
create crafting small ethical universes. And so as the makers of these small ethical universes, we have some responsibility, some accountability over what representations we place into the world. And so we started to ask what kinds of representations or critique, what kinds of representations are put into place by others and what kind we can put into the world. And, uh, and, and you know, if others can take us as a role model, then that's great too, but we have a sort of personal accountability about what kind of person we are in the world. Um, and then also in, in the classroom then, where I um, stand up and effectively act as a role model for the future, uh, working on actively on future generations and showing what kinds of thinking or what kinds of doing can be put into the world. Um, and so I think, I think of my teaching as a practice of advocacy, as a practice of, of questioning what should be in the world and how, how do we shape the world that we want to have. And I wonder if I could do a follow-up on that question to get some examples of sort of how your craft, how your art, sort of, um, you know, sort of the, the advocacy or the storytelling that you're trying to, uh, you know, trying to convey. And I'll start with you, Rafael, since you know, within sort of video games, right? There's a video game that you have created about sort of crossing the border. Do you want to speak a little more? Sure. So um, I was living and working in El Paso, Ciudad Juarez. Right? So this is, this is another sort of harmonic of, among the, the folks here on the panel. Um, and so I, we were witnessing, and I, again, the plural at this point, part of the plurality is a set of six graduate students that I was working with um, who were interested in this new kind of uh, media, the, the crafting of a video game. And so we, on the one hand, we realized that um, stories about the border in the academy, in the university s s setting, were emanating only from uh, San Diego and Tijuana. Um, and so we're erasing uh, Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, and we're erasing Brownsville and, and Matamoros, and that didn't feel right. So we wanted to tell a story of, for, and by people from Ciudad Juarez in El Paso. When I was teaching, 60% of my population in my classroom crossed the border every day to be in my classroom. And that, that was very, very compelling to me. Um, I, my Spanish improved uh, because I wanted to ensure that they had the same opportunities that my English-speaking students had. And so I would explain myself in English and explain myself in Spanish. So with my graduate students, we chose to um, explore, is it possible to make a video game that has highly charged, sensitive subject matter, and just set out to do it? Um, we were a little bit insecure, so we borrowed the gameplay from one of the most financially successful video games in history. We borrowed the gameplay of Frogger. And we changed the iconography. We changed the visuals. Did very little else. Um, at the, so at the same time, we were asking, can video games do this thing? We were critiquing video games. We were making representations of the US-Mexico border, putting them into the world where they had been erased so that people could see themselves. At the lower end of the screen for the video game Crosser, there is a set of buildings that are like 32 pixels tall. They were actually modeled on buildings in Ciudad Juarez. People from Ciudad Juarez could recognize the architecture. They could see themselves in that place. The people from El Paso could see them from the other side, across IH-10 and across Rio Grande. They could see themselves. The title screen has what is no longer there. After a century, Asarco had a a smelter plant that was polluting the environment. It was a hundred foot tall tower. That was on the title screen for Crosser. So people from El Paso and Juarez knew exactly where this game was located. Other people generically understood this was the US-Mexico border because we drew a dotted line in the middle of the river for them. Um, but other people saw themselves, and this was super important for us. Uh, did we know what we were making? No, we didn't know. We didn't focus group this. What we had no idea if there was a marketplace for this. Uh, we, it, 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 so in this artistic sense, 
it should exist in the world, so we try to make it. And then 20 years later, we have found out that people think there's some value to the thing we made, and we're happy and surprised and sad. Sad because it continues to be an issue. That's great. Lillian, with your sort of the medium you use, how does, what are those examples of sort of how the types of messages you're trying to promote? Right, so I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to do a show about Malinche. And um, for those of you who don't know, Malinche was uh, Cortez's interpreter. Uh, and she has become a, a slur, particularly against women. And so to be called a Malinche is to be called a traitor particularly a race traitor, right? You're betraying your, your people in quote unquote the same way she had betrayed her people to the Spanish. And so I had um, the opportunity to work with the Denver Art Museum and we were telling, we were retelling her story, right? This has been uh, Octavio Paz wrote a whole, you know, Rijos de la Malinche. And so um, we were trying to unpack that and tell this enslaved indigenous woman's story who went from being a thing, right, to be sold, to be traded into one of the most powerful women of that time period and to really give her that legacy back, right, to recontextualize her history. And so through the process of that, really learning more about her and her capacity to learn languages, I mean, I don't know how many of you have tried to learn a second language, but it is difficult, uh, especially the older you get. And so, you know, she was, she learned Spanish in a matter of months and you go from an indigenous language like Nahuatl and then you learn Spanish, which is Western based, um, Latin based. And she didn't have textbooks. She didn't have Duolingo. She, but like through sheer force of survival, learned Spanish so that she could then become Cortez's sole interpreter and didn't have to go through another Spanish person to be able to come in contact with Cortez. And so giving her that power through visuals, um, you know, I've always said visuals are incredible shortcuts for knowledge. You see yourself, especially through clothing. Uh, clothing represents so much status and power and it changes the way that you present yourself towards people and that the way people treat you. And so by having the ability to have we beads, to have traditional Mexican clothing so that young women in particular could see themselves in her story and, and relate to her survival and the fact that she was such an incredibly intelligent woman to be able to, to navigate and to be a power broker, right? She wasn't just an interpreter. She was advising Cortez on how to deal with the different tribes, the different groups, the different kingdoms in Mesoamerica and to evade bloodshed, right? So she was trying her best to be diplomatic in, as war as the last and final option. So how she could navigate this and then to only, we remember her as a traitor, I think does a disservice to her legacy and I think it does a disservice to women, right? This is an indigenous woman. Let's make sure that, you know, if someone calls us Malinches, it's like, hells yeah, I'm amazing, I'm intelligent, I am a linguistic badass and I can, power broke my way out of any situation. So I think the ability to have these conversations and have Latinas being like, I was called a Malinche. And you know, trying to unpack that just because I didn't fit into those norms and being able to have those conversations. And you know, to be allowed to be, you know, the privilege of doing that. Um, I think that was one of those ways where art and advocacy just blend so beautifully together. I guess wove so beautifully together powerful. How about you, Ricky? You know, I, I started out, um, I, I was taught by um, color field painters, um, and I wasn't taught technique. Um, they, they said, here's the paint, paint. And I, I was okay uh, for a little while. You know, I was a collage artist. I layered imagery that was culturally, um, historically, and, and personally relevant. Um, you know, there was a lot of like pop culture in my work. Um, I used to rip off every artist that I that I knew that was around me. Um, there was this artist, R Rolando Briseño, 
um, and Carlos Fresquez um, from Denver. Uh, and they use a lot of pop imagery, you know, so you have George Jetson, you know, colliding with Quetzalcoatl and, you know, there's a battle. And I used to do that kind of stuff. Uh, but I joked that, you know, you could throw a rock in, in Denver and hit another, you know, Latino that was making collaged artwork. And I didn't, I, I needed to, to distinguish myself, you know. And I was thinking about where I'm from, the border town, uh, the, 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 the Western aesthetic, right? I, was, I even uh, gave people um, a kind of a questionnaire and asked them, people that were here in the States and also people in Europe, as to, you know, what is your perception of the West and what does that mean? Um, and I got back a lot of like, well, you know, you guys ride horses and you ride, wear, wear boots and, and, you know, it's like the Wild West. And, and I seized on that um, and wanted to kind of use that and then also kind of erode that, you know, uh, for myself and, and in my work. So immediately I started thinking about where I'm from, um, the large landscapes, the sunsets and the sunrises, and how historically they uh, were metaphors, right, for birth and death. And so I was using that, those art historical references, and then I started writing my own song lyrics and, and, and actually appropriating song lyrics. So I would, you know, uh, write, uh, uh, you don't, like, I would carve into my paintings, uh, you don't need a weatherman, sabes que, which way the wind blows. Um, and, and so like, you know, it's a Bob Dylan lyric. You don't need to know, to have a, be a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. And, and I would carve this like profound statement into an equally profound, uh, sunset or sunrise. Um, and I thought that coupling those two profound things together would, um, make like a statement that was like candy, like, and then you would get kind of sick on, on the sicky sweetness of it. And also I, I really love the idea of taking on um, the idea of of landscape painting, you know, it's the thing of bad art, right? It's the thing of like, you know, starving artist sales. Um, you see them over your grandmother's, you know, couch, and and you, you know, they're terrible, uh, or maybe they're so terrible they're good. And and I I wanted to kind of reinvigorate that like kind of genre of painting, right? Uh, the three major genres being landscape, still life, and and portraiture. So I, I made these like conceptual landscapes um, with these song lyrics that were carved into the paintings of, and the paintings are on wood. So the, the paintings themselves are made very, very traditionally with oil painting, glazes, very, very illusionistically. In graduate school, I taught myself how to paint um, and because my ideas took me to that, that arena, right? Um, I needed to uh, hook the viewer by presenting them something that they recognized as art, like something that was valid as art. And I needed to, to do that so that I could kind of chip at them um, and, and plant the seed of my idea in, in their, their brain, right? And, you know, as my work evolved, um, you've been seeing images. Um, I'm very interested in border and border politics, which is kind of a thread um, that's going through our works. Um, I, you know, I, I can't go a day without looking at what's happening in El Paso. Um, I have family that are on law enforcement, and I have family that are in, uh, you know, uh, are on the legal side. So I have attorneys. You know, the joke is that, you know, my 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 dad puts them in jail, and my brother gets them out, and <laughs> and and it's it's like that duality, right? That is in a lot of our families, right? Um, and so, you know, those kinds of threads kind of run through my work. I'm very interested right now in um, the fact that, that people are, are kind of fed up with a lot of things, right? Our political system, um, what uh, kind of health care we have, how we treat each other and um, in respect to being good human beings. And, and so a lot of that is, I think, filtering through my work. You know, when I, when I was in graduate school, it was always like, like, you know, brown power and, and, you know, being in Boulder, right. I never felt more brown and I'm not even all that brown. Like, <laughs> you know, like I never felt more brown than it was when I was in Boulder. But I joke that like in El Paso, you know, you'd be on the bus and you don't like lean over and go, Hey, what is it like to be Mexican? You know, or cause it's just like, you know, it's all understood. Right. And, and you, it's not even, it's a non-conversation. Um, and so, 
you know, getting away from there, traveling more, seeing people that look like you but aren't you, you know, really kind of expands um, your your general understanding of who you are and what you make and and you know how your work can affect the world around you. That's beautiful. So I want to anticipate for our audience. I'll make one la one last question here, but I would like to open it up to the audience to see if you have any questions uh, of the panel. But as we sort of wrap up at least sort of the formal questions on this stage, you all play various roles. You're obviously um, yourselves as, 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 a, as a person, um, you're, you're educators, you are researchers, you are artists. I'm wondering sort of what, um, how do you hope sort of to inspire and motivate the next generation of artists? What might that look like uh, with regards to your own work? So, you know, I don't think that there's a more important role than being a role model. I mean, when I was growing up, um, you know, there were very few higher educated individuals that I could look to and point to and go, I want to be that, right? Um, in, in, uh, in high school, my Spanish teacher who gave me terrible grades in Spanish uh, gave me wonderful grades in art. Um, you know, in college, I mean, I'm talking one, right? In, in college, I had one professor who was Latino, uh, Dr. Jacinto Quiarte, who I later found out that he went his whole life being called Jack. And it wasn't until later when he became like Raza Proud, he, he went as Jacinto, um, which is kind of funny. And then like um, in, um, you know, w when um, I was... Um, well, that was an undergrad. And in graduate school, I had Dr. Uh, Jorge Rivera. Um, and, and that was it, right? And so I immediately, you know, day one, uh, Jorge came up to me, uh, Dr. Rivera came up to me, and he said, you know what? I'm going to do things for you. And he didn't know me. I'm going to do things for you that I'm not going to do for any other person because there's nobody here in this, in this program that's like you. He didn't know me from Adam. And, and I, I always think about that, right? Like how he gave selflessly of his time and energy and promoted me well beyond graduate school. Um, we, we were part of this group called Art Knots, which our mission is to take artwork into places that, that artwork wouldn't normally be. You know, I've exhibited on uh, North Korea and South Korea, in the DM8, um, DMZ zone, right? And all these like weird places in the Amazon, in places that artwork doesn't really go. And, um, and so he's been a big promoter of my work. So getting back to you know, what you were asking is, is like, it's being a role model, right? It's being uh, able to help individuals that are like me or think that they're like me to be able to kind of understand how I move in the world, right? How I go into the studio. You know, my, my big thing when I met artists and people that, that I admired, I was like, what do you drive? You know, like how do you get from point A to point B? What do you eat in the morning for breakfast? Like I needed, I needed that thing to, to grab hold of so that I could understand where I needed to go. You know, and yeah, in the beginning, you're mi mimicking people and, and you're copying, but through the mimicry and the copying, you find your own vision in your voice. That's great. Lillian? Yeah, I think for me, uh, I mean, I called myself an artist rather recently, um, past three years or so, uh, before I've just labeled myself a hobbyist or that was just a, a, a pastime for me. And I, was a teacher K through 12. And so when I would go into these classrooms, you know, you're right, representation really matters at all levels. Um, I had kids come up to me and be like, Miss, you speak Spanish? I was like, yes, Miss speaks Spanish. Miss, are you from Mexico? Yes, Miss is from Mexico. Both your parents though. I'm like, yes, both my parents. Where are we going with this? Um, you know, you have recess, go jump rope. And um, so it's just seeing it from the kids, especially being like, you look like me and you're here where all my other teachers don't look like me. They don't speak Spanish. They don't eat hot Cheetos like you do, you know? And so having that, and I was just, you know, I was there their art instructor. I was 
watching them jump rope during the recess and then I was making paper mache with them in the classroom. And so I think that representation at all levels, right? Not just in art, not just, you know, taking art where it shouldn't be, which is everywhere, it should be everywhere um, at all times, but recognizing people's creativity and imagination in whatever they do, whether you're an accountant, whether you're, you know, out there fixing roads and everything, the creativity and flexibility and imagination that you have to implore in every part of your life is needs to be recognized and you need to see see yourself as an artist right not just in the traditional sense of you paint you create but in the way you live your life and i think that little bit um i don't i think imagination is so important right and it's a muscle if you don't use it it gets atrophied it gets stiff doesn't mean you don't have it um, it just needs to be exercised more and just consider yourself, right? Everyone in this room, you're an artist. Whether you believe it or not, you're an artist in the way that you navigate your life. So I think that's, that's my piece about that. That's beautiful. There's an artist inside all of us. Exactly. Yeah. Rafael? Oh, gosh. So um, I'll echo some of Ricky's life experience in the... Uh, scarcity of role models that looked like me it had similar backgrounds um, K through eight nuns sister um, I, I wish I could remember all their names um, three or four nuns that were amazing that were Chicana um, high school yes I had I was studying with uh, the oblate priests in San Antonio um, Father Raul Salas Absolutely. Once I got to college, though, I got really lucky when I took a life drawing class that I took from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. after sort of the day's worth of trying to be an engineer to just keep myself sane. Um, there was a Peruvian immigrant graduate student who was assigned sort of the least desirable <laughs> time to teach. <laughs> Um, and who also happened to be a, a kind of a refugee from engineering and sort of showed me that there was this kind of a pathway where one could have permission to do this sort of shift. One could be technical and creative. Um, and and there that, that, that was something. So I, I value valued that, that opportunity. Um, but the other folks in, uh, among the faculty were, I did not have them. So I, I, I come to appreciate that, that, that I, yes, I need to stand up. I need to provide some kind of thing worth modeling and patterning after. Um, I'm a father in this role. Very early is because I was thinking about the scarcity of people that I could look up to in media. Um, I wanted to start crafting images that my own children could see themselves in, uh, could understand themselves as having uh, heritage from Colombia, as well as heritage from Costa Rica. Their mother is, is, uh, identifies as Costa Rican. Um, and so uh, I started, the next video game is, is one that I've been thinking about for a long time, and it's about Juan Valdez, the uh, imaginary representative of Colombian coffee. And since he has already been given so many favorable attributes by the advertising industry, I'm going to leverage that and turn him into a video game hero. That's great. <laughs> and so this is this is the this is the sort of the this is at, in the home and out in the world, is trying to be that that model. That's beautiful. So now let's turn it over to our audience members and see if they have any questions for our panelists. Feel free to stand up. And we'll recognize you. And Thank you. Um, I'm also on the board of Carbondale Arts, and I am a Carbondale creative collaborator. Um, I live in a space where you all live. Uh, I, I actually hate labels. And I'm a border girl from Laredo, Texas, Nuevo Laredo, Tamaulipas. I did live in Mexico and would cross daily to come to school. And I remember those days. I also married a fifth generation Carbondale local, a native. And so my perspective is 
broad, very broad. My uh, question is more along the lines of, uh, in the restorative stuff that I've been doing and in everything that I've been doing, um, one, I did realize going to grad school, first of all, I got kicked out of undergrad because I had needed time management classes to get my schedule back in line. And then I didn't think I was gonna be qualified enough or able enough because society had told me forever that I wasn't going to be able to go to grad school. So then when I applied, I didn't think I was gonna be accepted, but I wanted to show that I could apply. <laughs> and so I was accepted. And guess what? I excelled. And uh, now I finished and what it taught me was that what I intrinsically already knew was research-based. And so, how can we better equip the future of the people that are in front of us, one, and uh, around us, two, right, and the students that are in front of us, three, uh, to succeed? One, I think we have to be advocates for ourselves, but we are tired of only being advocates for ourselves. We also are tired of time as an excuse. We need to be proactive and we need to find more advocates that can advocate for us. And um, how do you suggest we do that in more restorative ways instead of punitive ways, which I do you know, dive into, but maybe you guys can give a different perspective and um, what would help you? I remember not going, I mean, I remember going into undergrad and until I read Sandra Cisneros, did I see myself in anything? You know, I didn't exist in literature, in art, in anything that was not demeaned by general population. And so how can we then empower and honestly take away the label to empower these students. And I love the gaming is one way for sure because it's bringing what we already know. Now, do you have any other ideas? Thank you. Who wants to tackle that one? Sorry. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I think that Rafael, I mean, you know, he's perfectly positioned, you know, in terms of uh, his technology and, and what that can do. I mean, you know, just think about it. You know, he, he is a designer. He can shape what uh, the player, you know, and reward the player by good behavior, right? Like do, being humane, right? Like treating um, our, our fellow people um, like, you know, real human beings rather than second, second uh, dairy citizen. Um, you know, I, I think he's perfectly positioned, you know. I think uh, we're positioned to to affect our, our ecosystem, the children um, that, um, you know, come to our work, right? Because our work is, is popular, right? In the sense like it's populist, right? Um, it's imagery that is um, very user-friendly, right? Everybody loves, um, you know, Dia de los Muertos. Everybody loves uh, coyotes, um, you know, and, and so it, our work is not, um, there's not, not hurdles to get over. And, and getting at the core of your question, I think it's, it, it's really just about representation, you know, doing more at a younger age, right? And showing that these younger people are valid in their experiences, their stories are valid, right? Regardless of who they are, right? And, uh, and then training that little army to go on and affect other people and affect other armies um, as they move along. I mean, it's not, I mean, you know, we're in the arts, but um, something uh, that our panelists kind of touched on a little bit is that our representation needs to happen not just in school and not just, you know, in college, but on the boards of, uh, you know, organizations, on in the uh, CEO uh, positions, right? Um, the boards of banks, the boards of, you know, Ginsavake, you know, like, and, and that's how, you know, things change, 
right? We're, it, what's going to happen is, is, you know, and it's something that, I've, that I joke with my family a lot about, you know, that they're from Mexico, right? But, you know, they quickly, you know, depending on, you know, I'm going to pick up my mom a little bit, depending on, you know, the person she's married to, she kind of morphs into that, that, that person a little bit, right? And, um, and so I, I think that, you know, we're wonderful chameleons, you know, we are. We pass, for, like I said earlier, we pass for everything. And I think that just getting our stories out and those stories being valid and acknowledged at a very early age and more people, young people, seeing that, the, that more of your, their friends are like them, then that's how things change. It, 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 it kind of builds an army from the base, right? It's the pyramid. We're, we're building... We're creating the building blocks of the things that, you know, we're holding up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it starts at education, young people. And so to, to echo and amplify what Ricky is saying, I will uh, boost two artists from El Paso Juarez. Uh, Raul III, who is currently living in Summerfield, Massachusetts, um, is now the author of several children's books that... Sh uh, that are bilingual, represent life at El Paso Juarez and sort of more broadly, uh, the, um, and are sort of like the Richard Scarry books, but are about bilingual Chicano, Latino, Latinx, Latine children. And he has recently gotten a, um, a contract where they're gonna do an animated series. Um, he's, he's still what we would all consider very young as an artist, so I, I, I applaud his success. Um, and it, so we can look forward to seeing in popular culture and in popular media um, uh, bilingual representations of um, what it takes to go to market. Um, not necessarily in a supermarket town, but in a, this other kind of existence. Um, what, it, what it takes to live in... in um, his first one was like called Lowriders in Space. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, he, uh, Kathy Camper wrote the, the words and he did the pictures. Um, and, and so I, I highly recommend his work. Um, and on a more sort of uh, young adult audience, David Ortega um, is um, also from El Paso, also was a deep, deeply close friend of, of Raul III. They're both living in Massachusetts right now. Um, has uh, made a, a, a graphic novel called Diaz de Consuelo. And it's the story of his mother, his grandmother, excuse me, during the Mexican Revolution at the US-Mexico border. It's absolutely beautiful, absolutely moving. Uh, and so I recommend this to you all at, at whatever level you're teaching. Um, we need to identify and uplift the names and artworks of these younger artists, um, um, and and so that they are on our on the, on the tips of our tongues, so they are at our fingertips, so that we can share them. All right, uh, we have to open the doors for the others. Lillian, did you have something? You yeah, I think just you know to echo that, and you know you know beautiful, amazing, talented people in your community that are out there starting businesses, out there you know, paving ways for other people or who've already paved ways and people need to know about it. We have such amazing talents and we have such an incredible resource. And I think it's about that professional development, that awareness, right? We have those talents. It's just about developing them and supporting them. You know, you know that the who's out there hustling blankets, right? You know, and you know the, the guy who's putting out a stand selling tacos. Like, you know he's out there hustling, and so it's all about supporting the communities, right? I could go buy a T-shirt at H&M, or I could go buy a T-shirt from an artisan who I know spent a lot of time and energy creating that product. And so I think it just goes back to creating 
these support networks, this professional development, these economies, these primary economies, these secondary economies. Money talks, so how can we make sure that the money is coming back to us and making sure that we know how to use that money, right? For a lot of us, we talk about the money it takes to run for office, to run for all of these different integral positions that really determine a lot of how our life is led. And so to us being able to manage that kind of money, to have the resources and the knowledge and the capability and the social capital to be able to then leverage that. And the confidence, right? You got to believe in yourself and your people got to got to back you up too, right? You can't just be out there on your own on the stage. And so I think it's about that and just being able to support each other, right? We're collectivistic. That's beautiful. One last question, and just also a reminder, we are staying after uh, the panel uh, for a reception, so you're gonna be able to meet the artists and ask them more questions. Can we go here? Uh, hi, my name's Anjanette Rosas Garcia, and I'm an art educator and also an artist myself. And I am really familiar with the starving artist mentality, but I look at the three of you and you look great. <laughs> you don't look starving. Can we get a round of applause for how good you look? Yes. And so, are, are you saying we're healthy? <laughs> or, you look or awesome. What do you mean? Okay. And so, I would say that it's not helpful for me to have this story in my mind when I sit down to make art with my students and especially with myself. Um, so what is a more helpful, although it might be true and I can find tons of evidence for that, what is a more helpful story um, about the value of art that you tell yourself when you make all of this work that you've made? That's part one. And part two is what are some examples where you've seen what you created, separate of you, existing out there in the world, inspire a change in a person or a policy or have some impact in the world? Thank you. Yeah, I would can, like to. Yeah, so I mentioned my, my journey to being an artist is relatively very recent. Um, again, I struggled with that starving artist mentality. You know, how can I do this? And it was this recognition of history, right? We have powerful names, Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera, you know, all the Posada prints, like we know big hitter names. Who doesn't know who Frida Kahlo is, right? And she is Mexican. So I think it's the recognition of history of and having those representations of like, these people look like you, right down, you know, to the thick eyebrows and the in the dark skin, they look like you and they are world renowned. They are in museums. Their art is worth millions or a uh, uh, value that you can't place money on. And so again, you are, you, you strive to be what you can see. And I think a lot of that is acknowledging those role models, right? Not just being one, but also looking through history and being like, we've done this. We've got this, we've just forgotten or we've been told to forget, or it's been excluded from our histories, right? Especially as you go through the American educational system, right? A lot of our stories aren't told. So it's about sitting with yourself or sitting with your students and being like, these are all of the amazing artists that work from pottery to stone to paint to fabric, and these are big names. You know them, you've seen their artwork and seeing and telling yourself, I can be that too, right? I have that innate power, creativity, and capability within myself to do it, right? It's just telling yourself that story. Lilian Lara, <laughs> give a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Rafael, do you have anything I, to add? I do, I would add to this. I, I think that um, we artists have allowed ourselves to believe a story that is bad for us, that if you're a true artist, if you are a real artist, you don't have a day job. Uh, and we live in an economic system that does not provide economic return on our, um, on our activities. 
Um, there are cultures where you, you just are a creative individual and it is part of who you are, whether there is an economic return or not. And so I think that it, it, part of the answer to your question lies in what is the economic relationship that you feel like you or your students need to embody. And so it, will your art feed you? If that is what you want it to do, then you may have to create artwork that is um, of a certain nature or a certain kind. Um, I have made a calculus where my day job as a university professor demands that I continue my creative development and that I continue to propagate art into the world. And so um, I, I have sort of put myself into a position where my day job feeds my ongoing creativity. Um, and, and so I, if we can provide models and, and examples for how you either have the, you know, and, and it, it, I won't say that it's easy to get the kind of job and the kind of role I have. It, it is extremely challenging. Um, but so how do we, I think, and I think it's still incumbent upon all of us to find the pathways where we can be creative, expressive individuals in the world. And if we can get economic rewards, that's fantastic. But I don't think that it's productive anymore to have a value system that says, if you can do it for 40 hours a week and feed yourself, then you're better than somebody who has, has to have a side hustle so that they can be their creative self. And so I think that we need to find a different narrative for that. Rafael Farjado. Let's give it up for Rafael. <laughs> Ricky? You know, I, I um, like, like I said before, I, I, I kind of came to, to art um, kind of kicking and screaming a little bit. Um, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't reinforced in my family. I didn't really think that um, I could make a living as an artist. Um, and I, 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 was, I was a stonemason. Um, I, I am a stonemason. Um, I was a stonemason in Boulder in Denver. Um, I was making more money than I make now and uh, as a stonemason. And I was selling my work. I was becoming part of collections. I was, you know, having exhibits at the Denver Art Museum and part of their collection and big collectors were collecting my work and, and I was working by day and, you know, beating my body up. But, but I, was, I was happy because I was making my work and I was doing the thing that I felt brought me joy. Right. And I talk to my students all the time. I go, you know, there's a, a person that I hold up uh, in high regard. His name is Gary Sweeney. Um, he used to live in Denver. And now he lives in San Antonio and now he's retired. But he worked for the airlines um, and his wife was a stewardess. And so that dude and his wife could fly to the Venice Biennale, show up fresh as a daisy and talk to curators and talk to uh, artists and, and network, right? And he never thought that that was really valuable, but I, I explained to him that this uh, day job, you know, he handled baggage for a living. He, he parked, you know, planes for a living. And, and yet he could still be a compelling artist, right? He could do the thing that's the most valuable, right? Which is networking, getting in front of people, talking to them about you know, the work that you make, you know, and, and them sort of liking you and your ideas, right? Um, you know, I have individuals that, that I, uh, again, really admire in San Antonio. Um, there's this lady that, that uh, wonderful, you know, but if, you know, uh, horse paintings are, are selling this month, she's making horse paintings. And, but she's happy, you know, making the work that she makes. So th there's no one model, you know. I joke with my students that they have to like kill me to get my job. Like that's literally <laughs> like the like the position I'm in. You know, I'm a I'm a full professor at a university, and universities are absorbing jobs like mine. You know, and hiring five people to you know teach five times the load that I can teach right at the same amount of money. Um, and so it, you know, there's so as creative people. There's no blueprint, right, um, like there is for dentists or maybe, um, you know, anesthesiologists, right? There's a set uh, 
amount of school and and path that they have to take. Artists have to be creative in um, in our day jobs, in our endeavors, so that we can do the thing that feeds us, that brings us joy, and support our family, and you know. Uh, affect the world around us, you know, and change, you know, the perception of, you know, the, the young army that I'm that I'm currently teaching. Um, it's it's all of those things that are, I think really important, you know. So, you know, being an artist, you know, it it, it is hard. It's it's like it's hard work. It's like brick lane. It's like laying stone, you know. And 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 if I had one thing to do. You know, if I have one idea to convey to people, it's that, um, you know, it, it, it's hard. It's not, it, to demystify what I do. I'm not a magician. I'm not, you know, uh, you know I'd love to be a magician, but, it, I'm, it, you know, I just can't. I'm just not like that. It's, it's grounded in really hard work and real practical stuff. You know, people ask all the time, you know, how long did it take you to make that thing? Well, it's like, you know, 53 years. Like, that's how really long, like, it really takes to kind of make something. And we don't get paid by the hour. You know, there's no way to quantify that kind of thing. Um, you know, we do it because it brings us joy. Let's give it up for Richard, R Ricky, Armendariz. Let's also give it up for Lillian and Rafael, the entire panel. It's been an extraordinary uh, conversation. Uh, I will not do it justice to summarize all the sort of takeaways, but here's some, some key takeaways, at least from me. Uh, one, art is a way to expose the world and culture to human beings. And representation, therefore, matters. So it matters that we have extraordinary panelists who happen to be Latina and Latino as well. And representation matters of making sure that all of us can see ourselves through the arts. I also heard another theme about there's a little artist in all of us. And so let's make sure that we can sort of find that artist in all of us. Many of you are educators, and so you have lots of young minds that you're trying to also uh, inspire and motivate so they find that artist within, within all of you. And let's hope that we get more opportunities to be able to come to panels like this and be able to have dialogue with extraordinary artists that maybe look um, like the more of the communities that are here in the Roaring Fork Valley. I want to thank all of you for being here today. I also want to thank our online audience uh, for participating um, online. And I want to thank all of you uh, and encourage you to continue to engage with the Anderson Ranch, whether it's through workshops like this, uh, dialogue and panels like this, other scholarships and other workshops throughout the year. I want to again uh, thank Olivia um, and Peter uh, and the rest of the uh, Anderson Ranch staff for putting this type of programming together. Remember that the Lat Latinx uh, programming is year round. This is not just because it's Hispanic Heritage Month, although it does happen to be here. So we hope you come back. You hope you continue to enjoy all the great programming throughout the year. And thanks again um, to the Ann and Chris Reyes Foundation for their sponsorship and support of the ranch. Again, thank you. Thank you.